Well, good afternoon again. Words and how we use them can uh, sometimes be important. It's why when I was growing up and my mom would refer to her friends and my sister's friends as her girlfriends in front of me and my buddies, my buddies would elbow me and give me a hard time because we didn't quite understand what my mom was saying. Maybe we did and they just wanted to give me a hard time. But also, there was a time when I was in seminary, we were taking a preaching course, and we had a bunch of people from around the world, and we had some international students, and one of the guys who was preaching ended up using a word that was very innocuous uh, in American English, and he kept referring, it was sort of like calling someone a rascal. (laughs) Watch, I'll find out later that that's a really offensive term or something. But uh, he would keep referring to people in his family as rascals over, that's, that's what we're all using the substitute, over and over again. It must have been about 20 times throughout this 15-minute uh, sermon. And as we're sitting there, there happens to be a uh, gentleman from the UK who was listening. And every time the guy preaching said this word, his eyes would get bigger and bigger and bigger until the very end where I thought his, they were going to fall out of his head. And when we started talking about what things meant, he raised his hand and said, you know, you've been using that word this whole time, and I don't think it means the same thing here as it does where I'm from, because it's very offensive and very inappropriate to be using in any setting, let alone in a church setting when you're preaching about God. And so we talked about just the difference of words and meanings and how they're used and how we understand them. This Lenten season, we are going to be focusing Uh, and discussing each week about different blessings that we have in Christ. And uh, while we often use the term Christian to to, to describe people who are following Jesus, even the word Christian Christian can be nebulous sometimes. It's why we ask, have you been born again, or what kind of Christianity, what kind of Christian are you? Do you believe? Do you attend regularly? Uh, Do you just kind of admire Jesus? Or, you know, have you devoted your life to following him? And there's all sorts of different words and phrases that we use to describe what a Christian is. But the Bible makes it pretty clear, even though, well, the word Christian is used three times in the Bible just to refer people who would generally be following Christ. It happens twice in Acts and one time in 1 Peter. But the Bible is very clear about the phrase what it means to be in Christ. In Christ is a theme that is found throughout the New Testament describing the benefits of being with, united with Jesus, uh, of being with God, being reconciled, and all sorts of other things. And so, even in Paul's letters, Paul's letters alone, he uses the word in Christ, in him, or in the Lord over 164 times. So he it said, Paul, at least, and to everyone else in the New Testament, is a very important idea of what it means to be in Christ. And so, it's not a big deal just because he uses it so much, but... It describes the connection that we have, our place of standing. If we believe and our faith is in Jesus, then we are in him. We are connected to him. And there is a deep and fundamental connection with Christ if we are considered in him. And so the New Testament makes a big distinction between two groups of people. People that are in Christ, who are united with God, and people who are not in Christ, people who are destined for judgment, for punishment, and who are outside the protection of God outside the forgiveness of God, and people who do not have an intimate relationship with God. And so, since in the remaining weeks we're going to be talking about specific blessings that are in Christ, I thought it might be good to sort of have a brief look at what it means to be in Christ, how the Bible talks about us being in Christ, and also the steps of how to become in Christ. Because I think those are very important. If we're going to be talking about blessings later, we should all want to be in Christ first. Now, when I was growing up, my friends and I used to try to get lost in the woods. Uh, It was kind of impossible for us because we lived in the suburbs of Cleveland. And I think sometimes when it was fall and all the leaves fell off the trees, you could see the roads from each side. So we couldn't get lost very well, but we still liked to explore. And we always found different things, like we found dog pits and, and just big rocks and trees that had fallen over. And one of the things that always was really neat to me was when we'd see a tree that had fallen over, there was the stump and it was rotting. And inside that tree was another tree growing out from that other tree. And we would look at it and we thought, how neat it is that life is being brought out of this rotten tree stump that was there before. And we had no idea where one ended and where the other one begins. And that's sort of a dark... I mean, it's, it's a dim metaphor and it's not very... Well, it's a, dip, it's a shadow of what it means to be connected to Jesus Christ. John 15, 5, uh, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says that I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, 
He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. So if we are in Christ, we have been grafted into Christ. We depend on him for health, uh, for nourishment, for our very well-being. All of those things come from our connection with him. And in some mysterious way that we can't fully comprehend yet, we have been united with Jesus so that we cannot be separated from him. And because we're united with him now, it means that every blessing that God offers Jesus as his son is a blessing that is also extended to us because we are in Jesus Christ. And so that is our pleasant, present place in Christ as we are here. And there's an astonishing fact, if you're looking at what it means to be in Christ, is that there are past, present, and future aspects and dimensions to being in Christ. Ephesians 1, 1 through 4, Paul begins the letter with this. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So again, we see that there is every blessing offered to us in Christ. But he continues, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Which means in a distant past before the foundation of the world, before anything that we know ever began, God the Father had decided that we were going to be loved by him, that we were at that point loved by him, And we were chosen to be an object of that love in Jesus Christ right now. And if we were to go uh, maybe a little bit more recently, 2,000 years ago, Jesus became a man. He suffered and died on the cross. And as as God the Father looked down on Jesus living in this world and he saw him, anything that Jesus did counts as if you or I had done it if we are in Christ. Which means that the life that Jesus led, the perfect life, perfect in love, perfect in obedience, is a life that we now have lived because we are united with Christ. It means that any of the obedience and the love and and whatever it is, suddenly we are perfectly obedient if we are in Christ. We are perfectly loving and perfectly loved in Christ. And it means that when Jesus was on the cross and he was hanging there, dying, that we were united with him, with our punishments being paid by Jesus. And these make us who we are today in Christ, that whole connection with Jesus and what he did through his dead, death, his burial, and resurrection. And because we're in Christ, there are some promises in the New Testament, too, that we can look forward to in the future as a result of our union. In Romans 6, Paul says this, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So again, Paul reflects back. uh, It's stating that we have been forgiven because of our union with Christ, because of what he did on the cross. And in the same way that he was raised from the dead on Easter morning, we can look forward to that resurrection, a physical resurrection in the future. And Paul also writes in 1 Corinthians, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. It is a certainty and a promise that God will keep that if we are in Christ, then a consequence of that is that we will be raised. So to sort of summarize this, in Christ we have a completely new standing. We have all of God's blessings. And God, we know that God doesn't withhold any blessings from his son because Jesus is also God. So all of those blessings that are extended to his son are extended to us in him. And our relationship with God extends before the foundation of the world, and it extends forward into eternity, where we will be completely united with God and with Jesus forever, again enjoying all of the blessings that a union with God stores. And so this means that if we are in Christ today, that he is our deepest and our foundational identity. No matter what anyone says, no matter how we feel, no matter anything else that we are, that is the one thing that makes us what we are. It's true that we are in Christ and that all that he has is ours. And it's not just a a way of knowing him in the same way that I can read a bunch of magazines or or books about uh, President Trump or any of the past presidents and know about them, but I can know who Jesus is, and in him, he knows who I am as well. If I were to walk by President Trump, the truth is he wouldn't know my name. He wouldn't know me from anyone else. But if I were to walk by Jesus, Jesus would know me. He would know everything about me. He would be able to surprise me with things that I didn't even know about myself because of that deep relationship that we have. 
So the big important question with all of these benefits and the ones that we're going to look at in the coming weeks, the most important question that we can ask is how are we, how do we get to be in Christ? On an unconscious level, it is all the work of God. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes this, and because of him, that is because of God, you are in Christ. He's speaking to the Corinthian believers who became to us wisdom from God. Jesus became wisdom. He became righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. On a level that we are not even aware of, God has moved all of these things. He's the one who's responsible for sending Jesus. He's the one who's responsible for moving all things throughout the history of the world and the universe so that we can be in Christ. On a conscious level, all of these things, our actions, on a conscious level of the way that we are conscious about our actions, it is all about faith, by trusting and relying on God. In Ephesians 3, Paul writes, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And in Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And again, in Colossians, through faith comes up. In Colossians 2, Paul writes, Having been buried with him, as with Jesus in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. God gives us faith. He leads us through repentance and makes us to understand his word and the implications. It's a lot like a call and response with God working through us. When we hear the word preached and we hear that all human beings were created so that we could enjoy God, so that we could enjoy his creation and we could rule over it and God placed us in that position, the Holy Spirit inside of us perks up our hearts. It's God who perks up our hearts and gives us the feeling that that's what we want. We want to have that unblemished relationship with God again. We desire that security, a blessing, a peaceful existence with God. And when we hear about sin entering the world and destroying that relationship, it's God who tells us that this makes sense. When we look around at the world and all the things that are broken, when we look at ourselves and our relationships, it's God inside of us that tells us there is something wrong, that this isn't the way that things were meant to be. And it's God who makes it personal when we hear Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. It says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands and no one seeks God. And we read Romans 3, 23 a little bit later. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God convicts us that there is a problem. And it's not just outside of us. It's not just something that we're living in. But it's actually something that's deep inside of us too. So Romans six twenty three, God convicts us that the wages of sin, what we've earned for our sin and separation, is death. And it's a punishment that's fitting for a crime against the most powerful being in the universe. God speaks to us, teaching us, reminding us that something needs to change. That when Jesus tells us to repent and believe, it means turning away from the lifestyle that we have where we are the ones who are making decisions. We are the ones who are only responsible to ourselves. And instead, we acknowledge that we're broken and that we're not fulfilling what we were created for, what God intended for us to be. And so we are moved by God revealing all these things inside of us to turn to God and say, you made me, you had a specific purpose, you made all of these things, I'm going to rely on you and trust you because you know better than me because you are the one who made this. And God responds by saying, you can trust me. This is a free gift that I extend to you. Forgiveness, a healed and completely restored relationship in me, a hope and a promise of a future. And that's all because of what my son did in his obedience. In Romans 5, 8, Paul writes, For God shows us his love in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so, as God walks us through all of this, and as we respond to God's leading, and he responds to us, we sometimes verbalize this, this feeling of repentance through what we call the sinner's prayer. And so we're going we're gonna to pray that, and we're going we're gonna to go through that in a little bit. But I want to emphasize that it's not the prayer or saying the prayer that saves us. It's the faith that God has given us which leads us to turn from leading ourselves to following him and submitting to him. That faith that saves us through what Jesus did. Saying the prayer is a lot like saying wedding vows. Now, they don't cause love between the two people who are sharing them. They don't officially make them a couple. They don't officially make them married. Because if they did, I would be married to all of the people that I 
whose ceremonies I, I perform, because before they say their vows, I say them to, to each other. And so I would have a lot more husbands and wives if it was just the vows that would make something like that happen. But the prayer is a lot like that. It's just a verbalization of the faith that God has placed into us in a way that we can say it outside of us. And it's a way of agreeing to the gospel. The gospel that says sin entered the world through Adam and Eve because they followed their own desires and disobeyed God. It's a gospel that says that we're broken, sinful, and destined to be unfulfilled in this life because we're separated by God from our sin. And when this life ends, we'll have to be punished by being completely separated from God. But Jesus, who is God's own son, became man, lived a perfect life in love and obedience so that he could take our punishment in our, and die in our place so that we could be forgiven and be in a relationship with Christ so it could be restored and that we could be united with God the Father through Jesus so that we could be in Christ. And the gospel is that this and all the blessings that come from being in Christ are offered freely to us because of what Jesus did, because of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And it's by God's leading that we respond in faith that God has given us to what he has already provided for us. So with all that in mind, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, I believe that out of your infinite love, you have created me. In a thousand ways, I've shunned your love, and I've gone my own way, following my own will. And I repent of each and every one of my sins. Father, forgive me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me, to save me from punishment, from eternal death. I choose this day to enter or renew my covenant with you and to place Jesus as the sole authority in my life. I surrender to him as Lord over me. I ask you, Father, in your generosity, flood our souls and my soul with the gift of the Holy Spirit so that our lives may be transformed. Give us grace and courage to live as a disciple in your church for the rest of our days. Father, we thank you for the forgiveness that was so costly, but that you offer us freely. During this Lenten season, remind us of all the love, grace, and blessings you extend to us through Jesus, and bless the food that we are about to eat in the hands of all those who have prepared it today. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.